Welcome to the Virtualization and Cloud Security Podcast, episode number 9 or 10 on the video podcast, and 160, I think, for the recorded podcast. You can find them all on Yahoo, I mean YouTube, sorry, and search on Yahoo, but YouTube, and as well as still on Talk Show. I'd like to thank my guests for joining me. This is Jack Daniels of Tenable Network Security. Jack, why don't you tell us what you do? Um, that's a good question, and if I knew, I would. Uh, I do a lot of different things at Tenable. Actually, uh, Marcus Ranum and I don't have official titles because some days we're doing things that you might call evangelism. Some days we're you know, building community. A lot of times we're working with uh, various teams trying to make sure that our, our message is right uh, in both directions. And one of the things I like doing is uh, talking to customers and others in, in the security and technology field, and more importantly, listening to them and, and coming back uh, to our teams and saying, you know, that's really cool. We do cool stuff. The world's headed in this direction. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we go that way? Or have you considered this? And that's why I'm I'm happy to talk to you today because, you know, a lot of folks have been doing cloud and virtualization for a long time, and not all of them have been doing it well. And more people are trying to catch up, and it's a moving target. And so, then, and there's some new challenges that, uh, you know, if you take a traditional approach to uh, any technology, you know, in our world, it's uh, vulnerability management and continuous um, monitoring. If you take that traditional approach, it's a lost cause. Right. So, you know, just how, give how up do now because right. it's right. over. So, <laughs> how do we, you know, so the challenges become how do we how do we adopt and embrace new technology without making the same mistakes over and over? Um, and how do we, you know, make take advantage of those things? Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. And also, you do a lot with these sites. Yes, I do. Um, I'm one of the co-founders. Besides, is you know very distributed, very built by community for community, and um, I'm one of the folks that's been involved since before the first one. And I'm on um, the global board, helps kind of steer and do brand protection and, and coaching and mentorship for uh, event organizers with the, the rest of the board. Michelle Klinger does a lot of that initial contact, and, and Mike Don and uh, David Mortman. We kind of steer the uh, program at a global level, but each event is run locally. And I work with a few of them, and I'm on the, the board and help run the, the big one in uh, Las Vegas and you know, help some of the others. And just uh, it's great community building. Uh, you know, words like community and engagement and involvement oh, are, yeah, are abused by marketing a lot, but it's, it's real within the B-Sides communities. And the great thing is that you know, each B-Sides is, reflects the local community and the local organizers. And so if you go well, to- But let's talk, B-Sides yeah. is a local security community and actually right. they invite everybody in. I mean, they right. always Absolutely. have, the first one I went to was the one that's beside, hence the B-Sides, yeah. the RSA conference one. That was, right. it's always interesting. It's a little bit more edgy than the, these traditional conferences right. in a lot of right. ways. And the one that, you know, so the one at San, in San Francisco, if you go to that one, it's in the Bay. So therefore, it's during RSA or in the run up to RSA these days. And it, it reflects that, but it's the edgier side of RSA stuff. It's, you know, there are more developers than there are elsewhere. Yeah. Besides in Las Vegas, uh, you know, that crowd tends to skew more towards offensive security, more for, towards pen testing because of Black Hat and DEF CON. And so that has a different vibe. It's also in Vegas. You know, if you go to the one in London, you know you're in London. You know, if you go to the one in Berlin, you know you're in Berlin. Um, and it, it reflects the local community. So if there are special interests, some of them are much more engaged with local universities. And so it really it brings that community level uh, engagement down so that it's, uh, you know, everybody's welcome. And it's one of the things that I, I love to go to B-sides, you know, especially the, the smaller ones in underserved areas. And, you know, even if they've been running three or four years, there are always a lot of new folks. And that's one of our challenges in security. We're not always good about bringing new people into uh, into fold. our community. Yeah, bring them into the fold and welcoming them in, I think. We're good at bringing them in, not necessarily good at keeping them, and certainly not welcoming them in. So that's one of the things I like about Well, and actually, when I was at RSA and B-Sides, they welcomed me in. And, you know, yeah. Alan yep. Schimmel does his bloggers awards and the blogger yep. parties, and I was <clears> always welcomed into that. But it's also, even though as a new person, I mean, relatively new to the bigger security world, I've always kind of been involved in virtualization security. Yep. Since I started with virtualization, it was a challenge as an ins as a person that does security for one part of the ecosystem and not the whole ecosystem. You get this. It's a challenge to break in and talk to people and meet the people. But to be honest, you just got to walk up to them and say hi. I mean, all of them are very nice and very comfortable to talk with. 
Yeah, absolutely. That, that is one of the challenges. And one of the, um, I recently went on a long rant about this, but the really short version is there are, there are a lot of Let's go for that, a short version. Yeah, so there are a lot of folks that uh, you will see at conferences, especially the bigger conferences, and they may seem aloof. So if you, you know, to pick on one that's an easy target. So if you try to chat with Dan Kaminsky at Black Hat or DEF CON, uh, he's probably busy. He's not being rude. He's a genuinely nice guy. He's a bright guy. And you can apply that to any name that you can think of. But, you know, if you tried to, if you tried to corner um, Charlie Miller at Black Hat this year, he probably was kind of busy. He wasn't being rude. He's buried. Um, and, uh, but, you know, they're very approachable people. And if you get to them in, in smaller circumstances, you know, not necessarily a B-sides, but, you know, smaller circumstances, people get to have conversations. And one of the things that's interesting about a lot of those people who are highly visible is um, people assume they're extroverts and they're not. A lot of us are um, not extroverted. Introverts. We're serious introverts and make a concerted effort to, um, to engage with people because it's what we need to do both personally and professionally. And uh, that's something that you have to realize. It's like, oh, I've got to, if I just stand here in the corner, uh, I'm not going to talk to people. So I need to, you know, just find somebody that, uh, yeah, it, that's mm -hmm. not buried and, and say hello and, uh, and go from there. And from there you make some, some great contacts. I, I know that you've done this. I've certainly, you know, unintentionally built a career out of it. I, I didn't build the career of networking to get where I am, but, you know, engage with the local security community, engage with the local virtualization user group. You meet a few folks, you share some ideas, you share a few more ideas and the next thing you know, we're chatting on a podcast and trying to, you know, advance the state of the industry, right? Yeah, and that's the that's the funny thing. I mean, I mean, I really want to talk about something else, but I think this is extremely important: is that if you're starting out new in security or even virtualization or any field of technology, and I'm going to leave out science because science is a whole different world. Um, but in any technology field, most of the people that are developers or have come from that developer background. I know you did, I did or have been that they're, they're engineering or whatever, they're really willing to talk to you. They wanna share what they know or they wanna find out something they don't know. So they're willing to have that conversation, but we're introverts. We're, I mean, the behavior that you and I have here is really trained behavior. Right. And that's what they're trying to do. And if you have that behavior and you wanna bring them out of their shell, just talk to them as if they were a human being. They're, I mean, they're, right do everything we normally do. There's nothing wrong with that. And if they are too busy, they will tell you, but they may be a little bit abrupt about telling you. Yeah. And one thing about that sharing that I think is critical is it, once you advance beyond the, the first few steps, um, you may be asking people for a lot of time or for valuable information. Yes. And um, I try to help people when I can. However, there's, there's a couple of things that help me decide how much effort to put in. And if I know that it's somebody that's an engaged member of the community, even if it's locally, right? Somebody, somebody at, a, at a local user group that I know has, has spoken, even on you know newbie versions of basic technology, this is somebody that's giving back. This is somebody that's engaged. So not to put it in economic terms, but they've made an investment and it's worth it for me to invest in that person if you want to if you want to put it that way. But people, you know, that sharing of information, your response your responsibility, I think, but I'm a little idealistic at times. <laughs> not, um, you know, your responsibility to share actually comes back to you. So you share what you know and you know th there's some really basic things that uh, sometimes uh, people overlook or are dismissive of. However, there's somebody else that's just started, right? There's somebody that you may have just discovered something yesterday that has been around for a decade. Well, next week, somebody else is going to discover that. There, there may be a perspective that you can bring that helps bring somebody else along. And, um, you know, if I see somebody like that that's trying to move forward, I'm absolutely going to make time for them because that's how I, you know, got forward. Oh, so you know, you sharing what you know is an investment in... in yourself whether you do it you know machiavellian style or just because you're a decent guy i don't or gal i, I don't care but uh, hopefully you do it because you're you're generous but um there's and, value in it so. and that's the difference between the community i i can i stem from and the community that you're you're getting into and the both of them when they intersect it really is about sharing and it's about giving back and it's about mentoring and it's about helping the community members but if you have a community member doesn't turn around and help somebody else you don't really want to help them anymore 
Yeah, yeah. You, you give you give folks a shot, and then um, you go where you know, where the dance is. And this this is a, a great example of where this there's this intersection of virtualization and security communities. This is a great place for folks that are maybe not the full in depth experts, because there are things that those of us on the traditional security side haven't really considered, and that we can learn from folks that aren't, uh, you know, true experts in the field like you. There are, there are folks that can Well, I agree. I'm not a true expert. I'm well, not a true but, security expert. But, I'm a virtualization with a yeah. heavy security background, right. but I but wasn't trained in yeah, security. Yeah. Right. So there, there are folks that, uh, that have, that are, that we can approach, right? It's like when I work, when I work with developers, you know, web stuff, that's not my world. However, you know, there's security fundamentals I can oh, try to yeah. teach them. And there are, there are the realities of trying to deal with HTML5 that I've never considered, which I'm, you know, make me glad I'm not doing web development. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> there are lessons we can share. And, you know, it, when I say lesson, that doesn't necessarily mean a formal presentation. That means, uh, you know, over a pizza and a soft drink at a user group meeting, uh, you know, five minute chat um, or a lot more. Well, and that's the thing about the community in general is that when you start talking between different dif different disciplines, you actually expose each other to different ideas and it'll make you think way outside your normal comfort zone and box. And that actually will spur you to be doing better things. Yeah. That's And that's, you know, a good thing. Get it, you know, if you, at the rate of change of technology and security, if you don't get pushed into un uncomfortable places occasionally or regularly, uh, <laughs> I would you'll, say end regularly. Up, you'll, you'll end up behind, right? You know, it's, it's part of the reason that I started the the um, Shoulders of InfoSec project, you know, a wiki of folks that are foundational figures in InfoSec. And I realized that, you know, I didn't know a lot of the stories and I still don't, but, um, you know, when you're in technology, right, you know, security is certainly one that evolves more rapidly than others, but virtualization does evolves it's stunningly quickly. Yes, it has. We fight to keep up and we never have the opportunity to, to look back and see how we got here. And so, you know, I, I did that to force myself to learn. You know, anytime you try to teach somebody something, the first thing you have to do is learn it better than you already know it, right? It's yeah. nothing like trying to teach something to teach you how much you don't know. Well, that's the um, thing is, if you realize how much you don't know, you're going to actually go out and try to find the answers to right. that. That's why I like talking to people, in the, the traditional security folks, because I want to help them out. But I'm also trying to learn from them what they're, what they're doing, what their yep. issues are. But that actually segues into something. I mean, there's um, well, we, in the virtualization cloud world, we look at certain aspects of basically being a checkbox today. We need them because of compliance more than we need them to be secure. And one of those is, and actually we talked about this at the uh, at VMworld on the last podcast, which was done by SiliconANGLE TV, and I'd like to thank them for allowing me to be on the cube with the podcast, was that the everybody liked the hardening guy. It's like, yep, we have to have the hardening guy. We've got to have that checkbox. And we've got to go through it and say, yep, we did. Bing, bing, bing. We're done. And, you know, I have hardening guides for my virtual environment. I have hardening guides for my operating systems. I even have hardening guides for, for applications. And I can do assessments to I'm blue in the face. And if, I'm on if I have on-premises computers, I can do them all the way down to the hardware. But they're really point solutions is the hardware protected, set up properly is the configuration of the hardware, it's the configuration of the network. But there's all these intersections that we miss. Yeah, so there are a couple of things. First, uh, you know, I live in a world where we do a lot of hardening stuff based on manufacturers guides, yeah, based absolutely. on government guides on all, all sorts of things. And one of the things that I always have to say, like, immediately when we start talking about hardening guides, or you know, forgive me, best practices guides or anything else. But when you're talking about hardening guides, it is a starting point. Unless there is some regulatory issue that makes you pin to the exact guide in front of you, um, just take a look at that hardening guide and see if it makes sense in your environment. Uh, Absolutely. You know, so that's the first one is the hardening guides. Um, they're, they're guides, right? It's like the, it's like the pirate's the code, right? More of a guide than a set of rules. Uh, Absolutely. But then... You're absolutely right. I can, I can, um, I hate automotive analogies as an old mechanic, but I'm going to, I'm going to use a bad one here. I'm going to preface it. It's a bad one, but you know, I can build uh, a really good brake system. I can build a really good uh, transmission and driveline system. I can build a great engine. I can build good seats and seat belts. 
Uh, that does not mean that if I assemble them into a car, the car is safe to drive, right? You know, so no, no, no. we can, to your point, we can do a whole bunch of things right and um, not bolt them together well. Um, and that's where, you know, there's, there's no way to apply a template. If you're looking at a specific operating system, whether it's running on bare metal or in any virtualization platform or, you know, in any sort of environment, you can make some assumptions and you can secure that operating system or configure it the way you want, whether we're talking security or not. But, you know, there's an abstraction layer. Even when I say you're running it on hardware, there's a, there's a, a system running under that, right? We call it hardware, but it's software, right? BIOS is software. UFI is, is software, DSM right? And, 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 and yes. but there's, you know, the hard drive has software on it that interfaces with things that, you know, the, the, if there's TPM chip, if there's, you know, there, there may be an, a, a lightweight operating system, if you uh, want to use that term for your video card, you know, there are all sorts of other things under it. There's always stuff under it then, um, and when we get into the virtualization and cloud world, um, it's even more obvious how little control we've got over that. If it's if it's a box sitting in in the um, in the shelf in my basement, excuse me. If it's a if it's a box sitting in the rack in my underground data center, um, I I have more control over it. Right, I can see what's happening. Exactly. I can, and that's... Right, I can, I have I have a tap on the line that goes out to the internet and. Um, you know, it's old school tap, and I've got a variety of things analyzing that traffic. So I can see what leaks out. Um, I don't always do the job I should, and it's just my home lab environment. But still, you know, when we get into virtualization, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, say, in the virtualization management plane that we start to not know about. And then it, at a cloud level, that's even more so. And so uh, I think it's more obvious how many things, and then there's, you know, we don't have that hang a tap off of it solution that I've got in, in my basement. Uh, Not anymore. Not right, anymore. You, know, you, have to hang, I, I, you have to hang unique taps. There, right. there, you can still tap to tap everything inside of a virtual environment if you right. own it. That's actually fairly easy to do these days. Those taps exist. I can do span ports. I can right, do right. virtual taps. I can do all that. Now, I mean, but I still have all these intersections I need to somehow figure out what security I need to apply. And if I own it all, a lot of that traditional knowledge still flows into it. You need to, in my opinion, you need to extend that traditional knowledge into the virtual environment. You can't ignore the virtual environment and say, ah, it's just a black box. Right, right. absolutely. You can extend it in, but when you start talking about cloud, now I have a real issue because effectively I got a black box that is an engine I have no idea if it's using plugs, helium, nitrogen, whatever. I got an engine out there that I plugged a bunch of stuff into. And now I have to do an assessment for compliance. Or I want to do it for security, but I have a security policy I need to meet. And that's what I'm trying to measure against. But once I get to the cloud, I can only measure what I can touch. That engine is still a black box. Right. And, you know, there are ways around that, but at some level, and, and I hate using the word trust, right? But at some level, you have to trust your provider. But the reality is you should never really trust anything, right? And that's that's one of the things we were talking about before we started recording is, um, you know, because trusting systems, anybody that says, for example, as a cloud host, that, whose answer to a question is just trust us, um, I'm or anything else, right? Anytime somebody says just trust us, um, I'm very skeptical to put it mildly. Very uh, skeptical. I mean, I mean, uh, people say however, trust us are basically saying, you know what? I got this, I got this bridge in Brooklyn. Right. I'll say yeah, it to you. Trust me, it's mine. If, if they answer with, well, this is, you know, here is uh, the infrastructure guideline that, that we use for building out our data centers. Um, you know, we've achieved these certifications. Um, we do these things. Here's our end user license agreement. These are the sections relevant to how we secure your um, infrastructure, how we validate our employees. Um, you know, if they if they're forward with that sort of information, uh, then it's a whole lot better than saying trust us. It's still not you're still trusting them. You know, air quotes. Not, to, but you know, if they've thought about it and have an answer ready um, that has some effort behind it, I think it's more realistic, but it's still up to you. And it depends on how you're putting things in a cloud environment. If you're, 
if you're doing it all um, as you're building everything, it's all inf at infrastructure cloud level, right? So the, oh, you have a the operating control. system and up, you have more visibility into everything because you build it. But if you're if you're going to um, something basically where you're just plugging into an application, um, then everything from the application itself back down to the the bare metal, uh, you've got no visibility into or very limited visibility into it. And uh, you know that may be okay for that application itself. But back to your point, um, you're trusting that application to interact with your databases to interact with. Uh, all sorts of other systems of yours, right? You're trusting that application maybe to provide um, content that ends up in your web properties, or maybe it, you know, it, it, one way or the other, coming or going from the web properties. Exactly. Uh, and how do you secure those connections? And it, it's not easy. You have to you have to do your stuff right, and then you. Know, I think that uh, there's a lot of monitoring in, in, course, in the cloud environment that becomes tricky. You know, you, you start doing things that we were trying to get away from you start looking at do i put agents and things do i route traffic through other systems to yeah. look at that yeah. traffic and of course the the you know the developer the performance side of you was like no wait the point is i have scalable you know theoretically air quotes infinitely scalable resources at my fingertips to address um, performance and scalability and reliability issues like I've never been able to before, and now you're going to put roadblocks in, right? It's it's kind of like you have the, the little devil and angel on your shoulders, and one's pushing performance. It, I call it roadblocks. I mean, what's what's stop? In, in there, because I'm not sure they're roadblocks. What it is is that if you actually have a proper architecture, there is a way to put all of that technology in play. What's called network function virtualization. In a way, and, and that includes all, a lot of the security components of networking, we can put those in at the right spot in the right way to actually have a high performance network. Problem is, most people don't know how to design it that way. They just kind of say, okay, I need, I need this here and this there, which just route everything through it. And they're running through one instead of several, and it's not distributed. It doesn't actually understand a cloud native app. We're trying to apply that old edge mentality back right. to something that has no edge. And we need to we need to break out of that and design our security to be as robust and distributed as our application. Right. And that, you know, that goes back to early discussions of moving to the cloud and, and folks that uh, move to cloud environments and cloud services, whatever they moved, if their approach was to pick up what they had running an iron in their data center yeah, and bolt it onto the cloud, uh, they had problems and they still do. And a lot of those organizations, you know, it may, may have bought them time. Uh, it may have shifted things from, from capital expenditure to operational and other things like that. But, it, you know, at this point in time, there are a lot of folks re-architecting things that went to, went to cloud not well thought out. Uh, well, and, and I, a lot of people are pulling back from the cloud until they can think it through. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that's sensible. Of course, you know, in fairness, a lot of people who, uh, I won't say a lot, some, some organizations who, uh, air quotes again, did it right, right? They re-architected for, for a cloud environment, um, weren't psychic, and they didn't know what the big cloud providers were going to end up looking like in far, as far as services and availability and interconnectivity. And so now... They uh, did it right uh, at the time, but have to re-architect now to take advantage. Although, you know, if they did a good job, the re-architecting is to take advantage of the distribution of resources and and really leverage the the increased power of, of cloud connectivity. And well, not only it's interesting that uh, I don't know what you are. You know, one of the things that I see, and you know, I know brands involved that folks will know. You know, some fo some of the cloud services that are very much. Here's a suite of tools which we're going to continuously empower and improve, and uh, there are some ways you can use it, and there's some other ways that maybe not work so well. But you know, here you go. Here's a toolkit, and there are others who really make it easy to do that. Um, unbolt it from your data center and bolt it into their cloud uh, model. True. And um, if you're comparing them without realizing how significantly different they are, you're um, you're probably going to end up in that re-architecting things sooner rather than later. Well, and you, I think you will anyways as clouds progress. I mean, let's just look at Amazon. I mean, I'm going to pick on them for a second. And Azure. They both now have some seriously capable directory services. They have right. 
encryption technologies built in. They have, you know, policies and, and more and more policies being exposed that initially weren't there. I mean, a year ago, a lot of the stuff wasn't there. I mean, just a year ago. I mean, from now, I mean, we were just getting introduced to some of the directory services capabilities inside of Amazon. But now they've come full circle and bolted on some policies to that, which means that they're exposing a lot more and becoming a lot more transparent, which allows me to take advantage of these to solve some of the problems I was already solving on my own, but in a more distributed manner. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think about, uh, you know, where Amazon is now as opposed to where they were five or six years ago, you know, when they were first launching. And I never used Amazon for any of my lab stuff at that time because they simply didn't do the things that some of the niche players did. Uh, exactly. I, I used, uh, you know, it, I used a, a smaller company, Swiss based that, uh, did some very cool things that no, I won't say nobody, but very few others were doing, right? And uh, I forget who said it originally, but it would be a bad idea to bet against um, Amazon getting things right eventually, right? I, I think <laughs> they're going to see what works, right? And, uh, you know, for, for that little internet bookstore, Amazon is doing pretty good for themselves. You know? Absolutely. I mean, to and, be honest, so is, so is Microsoft Azure and... Yep. They've learned yeah. from each other, and they actually play off each other. Yeah, they learned. I mean, we see them changing, so that my policy is no longer imposed by the cloud. I can impose my organizational security policies and security needs onto the cloud. I mean, a couple of years ago, it was the other way around, and in a lot of clouds, it still is the other way around. It's like this is right. our policy; you got to adhere to it. It's like, but it's not mine. Right. Yeah, that's that's true. Now, one of the things that um, is is somewat you know survivability uh, related, not traditional security, uh, that I worry about in in the evolving environment, though, is uh, originally when you know the big push was infrastructure as a service, and there were a handful of differentiators, and you know a few of the APIs were kind of close together. The idea of moving to one cloud or, or doing fault tolerance, redundancy, resiliency across multiple providers um, was was theoretically possible. And as now, you know, to pick on the two you name, not to pick on, but to call it, you know, if you really leverage Amazon to the full capability of what they can do for you, um, and or do the same with Azure, you know, Microsoft Directory Services, and you start, you know, you're, you're cranking your your infrastructure and rolling out Windows 10 if you're that brave in the environment, and you're really leveraging all of the security and all of that. The idea of unbolting anything from Azure and bolting it onto Amazon or vice versa just makes me think about, um, you know, uh, becoming a barista or something because the, the interoperability uh, requires more and more abstraction layers. So I get, I, you know, in fairness, but there that's, are that's the abstraction layers exist, but you're, you're now re re you know, relying on a third, fourth, fifth party to, uh, to make those things play nice. And so there's a vendor lock in challenge, I think, and uh, comes back to making sure that you can have policies that work for you. Exactly. And that's what you really ultimately need because when, push comes to shove and so it becomes a legal requirement because you had a breach, you always fall back to your security policy. You always fall back to that policy and then you go through the assessment phase, you do all the, you check everything that's supposed to be in that policy, you follow the guidelines and then you get to the cloud and it's like, okay, what did you do that did not adhere to my policy? And if you can't get that out of the cloud, you're, you, it's a lost cause. You're going to be right. saying, basically, I'm sorry, it's a black box. They impose this. But now things are shifting so that I can at least impose some level of control on my cloud. Right. But that always begs the question is, how do I assess that on an ongoing regular basis? Because, you know, you and I both know when the QSA rolls in with their PCI compliance, that's when they do it. And they should be doing it every five minutes. Right. And that's, you know, in our, in my day job world of vulnerability management, we push that. But the reality is that we don't have the time to fix everything. So I, I spent a lot more years as a SMB, you know, more on the small side, small to mid-sized business, uh, networking systems, security admin, you know, building, running and defending um, small environments. And, uh, you know, the more time I've spent in 
enterprise and government, talking to people the past you know, many years, uh, one of the things that's just absolutely apparent is that the problems we have in managing and securing systems scale much more effectively than any of the solutions. Absolutely. Uh, that, that, you know, some of the cloud technologies act really help address that scalability issue, but our problems scale really effectively, uh, unfortunately for us. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got these challenges and we, we can't fix everything. You know, that's one of the things that uh, the Verizon DBIR, every year I read it religiously, and I, I think it's a fantastic document. But if you read through it, it tells you that uh, the, the big noisy vulnerabilities really do own a lot of people. And then yeah. 7 million other vulnerabilities also own people. And then they say, uh, you know, the top 10 or whatever vulnerabilities wipe out X number of uh, companies within a matter of weeks from the release of the exploit. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, anything that they saw exploit, I forget the exact wording, but basically anything that's out, been out there for over a year that was used to exploit, it continues to go forever and ever. So what they say is the uh, flashy stuff matters, uh, the low and slow matters, the newsworthy stuff matters the immediate stuff matters and the old <laughs> stuff matters so it all matters and then you come back to but i i i can't even get an accurate device inventory i can't even get an accurate image inventory of what's in our cloud and we pay amazon this much money every month and it, it takes me weeks with a spreadsheet to figure out what's running how am i supposed to patch it all um well, so if you're you know, still we, using a spreadsheet with amazon you're really doing it wrong yeah, but you know, as does everybody yes, watching or listening, sooner or later, every problem ends up in Excel. It, it's, we don't like it. <laughs> even I, even the people that work on Excel are like, really, don't, don't. We have this thing that does that, uh, you know, but it's amazing what ends up in a spreadsheet. Well, you know, that's, I bet in Microsoft, the Excel problem reports end up in Excel to solve the Excel problems. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a very... Uh, a very uh, self-referential. There's a there's a reference loop in there <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> but when, a, when you start a... talking about this, it's like you're right. Everything will end up there. But I need. I think there's a need for continuous assessment tools that provide me at least. And taking. And I think it's more than that. I think I need to do assessment tied to threat analysis, and threat sharing to say, you know what, of these seven million old things. Which ones do I really, am I vulnerable to, and tell me? And then right. it's like, but we don't have that. It's like the DBIR comes out and says, oh, we got all these problems. You need to pay attention to them. It's like, but I can't pay attention to them all. My team can't pay attention to them all. I can't even divide them up. So we it, need some I way of sharing and saying what's the most. There are challenges yeah. that are related to this. And it's like the, the SIM challenge, right? The, 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 the forensics uh, and incident response challenge that's related to data. Right? First of all. Um, when you're trying to find something, you have too much data. Yes. But when you're trying to find something specific, it turns out you don't have quite enough data, right? So we always have <laughs> too much data to sift through, but not quite enough data to do what we need. And, you know, the, the approach, it varies, but I think the approach of trying to gather more, put a little effort into what you keep short-term versus long-term, uh, but if your tools don't let you filter quickly, right? if, if you can't uh, reject the stuff, if you can't sort somehow, you know, whatever, whether we're talking about having, you know, 30 machines at a small business and knowing what software is on them or whether we're talking about, you know, 30,000 virtual instances within one of your multiple data centers, there's got to be a way to gather fundamental information and then sort it. So when, you know, when the next person takes a close look at some underlying open source library that we all rely on blindly and have for decades, we can say, oh, I, I don't know what's vulnerable to this, but I know these are the public facing web servers or these are our public facing mail servers that accept SMTP connections on port 25, so unencrypted SMTP. And just being able to pull down, and, and whatever your environment is, it may not be that specific. That shows that I'm an old network guy, but you know, it, whatever it is in your environment helps you say, oh, this is what I need to focus on, right? And then when you're not chasing that next big vulnerability or next attack, or you know, not wondering about the next uh, reflective uh, DDoS methodology, 
Right? You can look at it and use that for you know your upgrade planning, your maintenance planning, for just performance testing. It's like okay, let's let's yeah. see how all of our you know load balancers are performing, whether they're you know a, a piece of iron in a in a rack uh, next to you in your office or whether they're virtualized. You know, knowing the fundamentals and being able to sort that out um, is a challenge. And it's, it, but if you don't have that, if you don't have good baseline information and you don't have the ability to ignore what you want to ignore, you know, that's one of my mantras is, look, people, you need to know, you need to know all the devices, all the systems in your environment. You need to know everything you've got. Well, in the cloud, and, actually, yeah. sim in the cloud simplifies that in a right. lot of ways because there's absolutely no way in a cloud environment that you will not know what's out there because it's right. all in the inventory inside the cloud. Right. Eventually you'll get there. Well, no, it's all there. I, I, right. the only, what, other than the engine that you can't see into, right. everything you layer on top of it, you can see. The, the challenge that uh, I see in the security world is a lot of times the security teams don't have access to that level of information. They're trying to secure without being able to see full inventory, right? They fix this problem, but they don't have access, right? Well, you know, wrong. Eventually somebody has to pay a bill and that's you know this is all billable right so that that's out there uh but the, you know the point about finding it all or knowing what's all out there uh back to the point we can't fix everything you know in an ideal world we, we simply can't fix everything we can't fix everything immediately not only that we can't fix everything but if you can if you have a grasp on what your environment looks like um you get to decide what to ignore right don't that's exactly. the, the key you decide what to ignore. It's not that we're going to make more work for you. you. You can't do more than you're doing now. You can probably do it more efficiently, but know what you've got. Then you decide what to ignore. And it's, you know, there, there are things like that. And that always gets into, you know, well, I've got to do the mission critical stuff. Well, the mission critical stuff, you can't knock offline for maintenance. So what do you do? Uh, you know, I, I like to remind people that there are systems that you can um, you can patch and think about what happens. Uh, you know, what's the first systems you patch? The most critical ones? Eh, maybe not. Even with regression testing, what are the first systems you patch? Uh, the ones that you won't get yelled at if they break. Exactly. Uh, the ones that can recover quickly. Another place where cloud does a wonderful thing. You know, I talk to small business people and they still freak out when I tell them, you know, the best way to patch is never to apply a patch uh, to a production environment. Like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, okay, there's this disconnect from traditional old school you know admins in particularly in small business but also in an enterprise no you you just spin up new instances that are fully patched right you you fully and you deploy them fully patched you know hardened to your hardening guide back to an earlier point and then you shift the workload and the idea of shifting workload reminds them of upgrading from Exchange five to Exchange five five, and they just go in the corner and weep. And it's like, no, no, we, we, <laughs> we need to re-architect this. Um, yeah, don't don't go from NT three five one to NT four in one weekend, and then do the five zero to five five migration the next one. Those, well, these are not those days. That was a long is, time ago. I mean, I'm going to take an actionable item, and I always want an actionable item in my podcast. And the really actionable item that I'm going to say for this one is that if you're a security guy and you do not have that visibility. That visibility exists. If you're dealing with clouds and you do not have access to look at that or don't have the tools to give you that inventory, go talk to the cloud administrator because he's not giving you the access you need or the information you need. Talk to each other. Find out what you need. The other one in the virtualization world, that same inventory exists all the way down to the networking and what port is connected to what. That exists in, in an easy, congestible, in, 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 um, not congestible, but in ingestible form. And again, if it's not being shared between the teams, then you're each doing yourselves a disservice. And you need to get that information. And I agree with you. There's still this, this split and dichotomy between the teams, but it's got to end. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, from the, the security side, one of the one of the things that I find, um, if you don't, if the si you know, everybody's siloed, but if your silos are uh, friendly silos as opposed to hostile ones, um, from the security perspective, if we talk about um, resiliency or survivability or other words other than security, we're often talking about the same thing, but Absolutely. it makes it a lot easier to have a conversation with developers with traditional administrators with other folks it's like how do we address uh, fault tolerance how do we address survivability scalability resiliency all of those sort of things they're all a factor in it 
Um, and how do and, I know where my workloads are living, right. whether they're you know, in the cloud or this inside is, of a right. environment? You know, this, this is what we've got for information. I would like you to share this with us. You know, by the way, we have this type of information. You know, is any of this of value to you? I'd be happy to share, you know, what we do. You know, we do, you know, we've got trending on, link, you know, age of vulnerabilities and stuff. Would you like to see this? Would you like to see, you know, our breakout on, you know, trending of uh, mean time to patch on, different platforms, is there any of this that you care about? And, and you know, don't just ask for something without offering something if, if possible. And it may just be, all right, I'm gonna consume what you give me, and would you like me to make this available back to you in the perspective we look at it? Uh, you know, if you've got the tools that allow you to do that. It's like, we're gonna dump this all into our, again, you know, my world, vulnerability management platform. Do you want me to give you oh, a, a simple for... login? You know, a simple login where you can look at a dashboard. It's read-only. I'm not going to yell at you if you don't do anything. But you can look in and see what it looks like in our world and make sure we're on the same page. Like, oh, does that mean when the – back to the other point. Does that mean when the QSA shows up, I can be ahead of the curve? Uh, or whatever it is in your environment that, that causes the, the uh, PCI-level pain, uh, we can get ahead of that curve. And that's where – uh, you know, maybe we can tear down some of the traditional barriers between the, the department of no and security and maybe become enablers or other buzzwords. Well, actually, I, I call the uh, department of K-N-O-W. Ah, very good. You got, I mean, it, this is all about knowledge. And if you're, not, if you're in the security world, in my opinion, if you don't have the knowledge of virtualization or cloud, gain it. You have to. Right. You, you won't, your career will stagnate if you don't. Just, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if your if if your company has issued you a a Windows eight or above laptop, uh, you're you're running virtualized. <laughs> well, it's modern really... Windows OS, you're virtualized to the teeth anyway, even when you don't realize it. Uh, so maybe you want to know what's under the hood, right? I mean, it's uh, you know, I, I have. It's interesting when you expose virtualization in modern Windows. You're all you're doing is exposing it. You're not really installing anything anymore. It's there. Yeah, right. and it's also it, in the hardware. I mean, we're right. virtually. I mean, it's all every modern Penti, every modern Intel machine has been virtualized since for uh, Nehalem's almost because it was right. built into it. Actually, before Nehalem, but it was all built into it. And if you have those chipsets in your laptop, you are virtualized. Right. Exactly. And when the vulnerabilities is... that impact virtual environments will impact those environments as well in different ways and that's where knowledge comes in that's where you right. need to start saying hey this particular attack may not be targeted to where you think it is right Absolutely. or you know what let me show you i mean you having performance problems this is actually one that i like doing i like taking application performance management stuff and layering kind of like do the same exact diagram from a security view and if you layered those two on top of each other, you will see a correlation. Right. A hot spot in performance will probably show a hot spot in security. And it's basically, okay, what caused that performance problem is probably a security issue. But you won't know unless you do that overlay and you look at it together and talk. I mean, years ago, I asked a question at RSA which was what was the early warning system for virtualization and cloud technologies. And most people say, oh, we, we, we use vulnerability management and we do this. And some of the other people, more virtualization focused people said performance management because performance management is looking at data every five minutes. Right, right. Abs and we're absolutely. used to it because that's what VMware vCenter did. That's what System Center did. We're used to looking at all that performance data every five minutes from a virtualization and cloud world we're right. now just trying to get that same information into a security construct that's that's what splunk does in a lot of ways i give splunk my data i can do enterprise security and bob's your uncle i now have some useful data it all came from performance right absolutely absolutely I mean, you got Tenable has their 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 platform, a PBS, and what's the other the, one? The the so the log correlation engine is the one that is interesting because we pull event data in, and that event data does statistical analysis. So the passive stuff does goes into that as well. And again, if you're talking about something changed, right? So there's there's performance issues. We can see things. Uh, any system that does this well, like you said, you know, Splunk's been doing it for a while. We do it. Others do. Uh, let us see 
performance data. Let us get logs from other systems. Let's you know, again showing that I'm an old network guy. You know, send me, send me your NetFlow data. Watch watch when your network traffic changes. Watch when there are anomalies in network uh, behavior. Uh, in especially inside pieces, and it doesn't matter whether it's inside, you know, inside your your cloud infrastructure. What's talking to each other within, you know, on the backside of all your systems? You know, they they should have a fairly consistent set of traffic, uh, probably driven by or at least reflective of the load between, say, your offices or the the web services. But you know, if if things change dramatically on one side without changing on the the other side, you know, if if output changes without input changing, uh, you know, there's an issue, and that is probably back to your point. Uh, anytime those things go weird, I'd be willing to bet performance is off somewhere, right? Oh, absolutely, it is. I mean, yeah. I had a similar constraint. I mean, this typical example. I actually need to write this one up because the solution and what caused it was rather intriguing. But I was getting some. I was getting an ARP broadcast storm from. A certain set of servers and it took me going to Wireshark and all the networking data just to find out what in the world why was my network behaving so badly and it ended up being a misconfiguration for security actually it was a security bit that was misconfiguration misconfigured once you saw that all the performance problems went away right and you know granted it was around log analysis and things like that but you've got to have that that takes some institutional knowledge it takes knowledge of the subsystems, it takes knowledge of security, it takes knowledge of the applications, and it takes knowledge about what in the world's happening on your network to start with. So when we start talking about assessment being assessing and harding guys, like I'm going to assess to this harding guy, boom, 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 boom. When I start looking at an anomalous traffic and anomalous behavior, I'm actually getting into those cracks between those, those assessments those things where they interact. And once I have that, I now have a much fuller view of my whole environment. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, back to what we talked about earlier, that you need to have built an environment with the tools that let you see that, you know. But what, what does it look like when it leaves this part of my world and what does it look like when it lands at the other side? Or well, <clears throat> I would say you need to have yes, some visibility. You have to have visibility, but it's not about leaving this part of the world and entering that part of the world. It's like it's leaving this application entering another application. Right. And in cloud and virtualization world, we don't have edges anymore. Our trust zones are basically a single VM. And I mean, everything's been migrated down and condensed around this. And now we're moving to containers where it gets condensed even more, where the boundaries for what we can normally call security zones, trust zones, whatever you want to call them, have just shrunk incredibly. There's no more right. edges. Right. It, it's it's at any transition. So not I, mean, I didn't mean necessarily from one data center to another, but any, any transition, uh, any transition point. And as you said, those are getting smaller and smaller. They're down to... You know, in some in some cases, the transition is from user to user. Some cases, it's from one container to another. From, you know, sometimes it's from an application to the network. Um, but at those transition points, that's where um, that's where things get interesting, and uh, it's where we can make a difference. And as you said, I, I think the the canary in that coal mine performance is probably the the most reliable one, no matter what it is you're actually chasing. Right? If you're chasing security, if you're chasing if you're chasing cost of, uh, you know, if you're chasing your, your annual uh, corporate Amex bill from uh, Amazon, right? If you look at performance, that's going to give you, you know, early warning of, of a bunch of problems and help you diagnose, pinpoint and diagnose. Like the horror stories we've been hearing about people embedding in GitHub their, pub, their public pass, public account names and passwords that would be used for Amazon. People are trolling that, getting access, track, tracking up $10,000 in an hour, you know. This stuff happens, and you shouldn't oh, yeah. be paying it's, attention to it. <laughs> yes, that that's that is very real, and uh, yeah, it's and even people who try to avoid doing that. Some, what was I forget the details, so I don't. Mistakes are made. They're human. It, well, there was there was one where uh, a commit was made to GitHub, and it was using a framework um, that specifically says you know strip this information out, and the checkbox was checked, but that feature didn't actually work was a bug in the feature and so Ouch. they trusted the framework to strip keys uh, it was found very quickly and the cloud service provider uh, took care of the charges because it was found quickly and the bug reports filed and the frameworks fixed but it was just one of those where even when you do it right things don't always work um, 
people but write software. So people. This involved. was somebody monitoring his environment and saw a change, and said, "Hey, something's wrong," and acted quickly and saved himself a lot of grief and what was, uh, what was that very the, um, the very first hacking group that was caught by an accountant by accountant? I found a fifty-eight cent difference. Oh, um, the cuckoo. I have the. the the books right over there in the next room. Um, <laughs> Is the cuckoo's something? Yes, the cuckoo's, uh, cuckoo's nest. Was Clifford nest? Stahl. Clifford Stahl. Yeah, uh, Clifford Stahl. It was just an accounting issue. And it's like, oh, 58 cents. Where'd that 58 cents come from? Large numbers people overlook. Small numbers people concentrate oh, that, on. I, <laughs> Right. That's, that's one of the things in, on the you know network analysis side that I always tell people, and I've been saying this for years, and it's it's still largely true. You know, you put a new network analysis tool in a network um, or in anywhere in an environment, and the first thing people do is look at the top ten. Yeah. Like, no, look at the bottom. Secu security people, we're like, let's look at the bottom ten. It's like, huh? Look at that. Three packets a month to um, you know some province in uh, China, and we don't have a Chinese affiliate. That's interesting. Sooner or later, that's not going to be three packets a month. Let's fix that, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's just the mindset. I think that we all have to be a little, a, little, yeah, I mean, a lot curious and a, a, a bit skeptical. And you know, I look at mine. I mean, I use performance management tools all the time on my website, and I'm always looking at the um, external web services that are used because I've actually found within several times several attacks that have hit the site and I've had to rebuild it. And the thing is, is that unless you're looking at that data, you're not going to find it. And our tools need to, I, I actually think this now on major containerized stuff, containerized applications like Netflix and so forth, that data is so grand that you actually need better tools to understand it before you can say, yeah, that's really a problem. And I don't know if those tools really exist yet. I, I don't know that they do. We're always trying to catch up with our with our tools. Um, right now, it's human knowledge. Yeah, that's well. That's that's part of security. That's part of technology, right? It, we always drive to automate things because there just aren't enough folks uh, engaged in doing things for a variety of reasons. But um, any challenge that we've got at some point in time um, requires smart people with experience with training and with access to information because they're going to need more knowledge uh, to address to tackle a problem right sooner or later it comes down to somebody or some group of people attacking a problem and they have to have a, a good head start on the knowledge and be able to get the info they need well and then let's we'll circle back to the beginning is to be honest if you have an idea and you're not the most knowledgeable person in the world and you have an idea of like hey i really think this is a good idea Bring it up to the community. They're willing to help. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is its like, hey, I want to tie this data to this data, and I don't know how, but I know I need to do it. Someone may have already done that for you, and you just need to ask, and they'll say, oh, you know, here, we've done that. Here you go. Or, you know, there's this product that we developed. I mean, someone, IP is IP, but, you know, people are always thinking you need to always tie it back and, and investigate how to help get the help you need. If you have an idea and you're just starting out in the security world or you're just starting out and trying to do virtualization or cloud security, ask, please. Yeah, absolutely. In one of the things that I like about uh, a lot of user groups, uh, you know, in the, in the Boston area, we, we have a ton of them and, and a lot of them start with, you know, introductions and other things. And they, they go into Q&A before you get into whatever the possession. And those Q&A sessions often are, are exactly that. It's like, I'm fighting this thing and I, I've got to be overlooking something obvious, but I'm here's what I'm up against. And that, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, it's this checkbox. And other times it's somebody else will say, oh, man, I've spent the past week fighting that same thing. And, uh, you know, the next morning, uh, two teams at two different companies uh, are putting their heads together. And, you know, some vendor that overheard it, but lesson for vendors, was discreet about saying that we'll sell you a solution, calls and says, we might be able to help you have some visibility. This is what we've seen. And the next thing you know, the problem's solved and then... What you should do is give a talk about it at that user group meeting in a couple of months and explain how you solved the problem. So the next poor schmuck <laughs> fighting that battle, it's like, oh, man, I went to that meeting like a year ago. What was that? Let me dig up that guy's notes or let me let me dig up her notes from how exactly. she solved that problem. Like, oh, that just saved me like two weeks of agony. And that's true. And that's the thing we face all the time is if you don't share the knowledge, 
I mean, this, it's, in my opinion, security needs to put the KNOW, the knowledge and innovation. They have to put their knowledge into it. Right. Virtualization cloud, traditional da data center folks need to put their knowledge in it. The operation folks need to put their knowledge into it. Right. And the developers have to put their knowledge into it. And then that bucket of knowledge has to be shared amongst them all and amongst everybody else. And without that sharing, we're not going to go anywhere. Right. We're just Absolutely. stuck. Absolutely. We're, we, uh, in technology, we reinvent way too many wheels. We don't even get them round on the first try many times. <laughs> Uh, and you know it's it's sharing stuff and you know sometimes it's sensitive things that you can't share completely uh if you're in a competitive environment Absolutely. or a sensitive environment however just sharing some hints could be a good thing <laughs> sharing it's like uh look i i've you know somebody works in a in a classified environment whether it's private or public or whatever like, you know, I, I can't say much, but I'll tell you what, I've paid more attention to our in public facing NTP servers in the past week than I ever thought I would. That by itself is going to give a bunch of people like, oh, huh. And that's enough for me to think, oh, the distributed denial of service reflection attacks are probably cranking back up. Oh, did I leave any? Right. You know, just a hint would do us some good. Well, and that's, um, where, that's where all these threat sharing platforms come right. in and where we really need them is it's not just threat sharing. It's. To me, it's just sharing of not necessarily threats, but the problems I'm facing today. And they become, so like if I see in a segment of industry, and this is actually would be really interesting, instead of saying it's a threat, which it really probably could be, is like I just started seeing this segment of problems. I have no idea what it is. But it's like you just said, okay, yeah, I've been spending a lot of time on NTP, and I share that across the world. It's like, oh, that's a reflection attack. Here you go. Here's the solution. You know, but I'm still saying, okay, that part of the industry is now getting hit by this particular attack or this particular problem. You know, that's got to be either an update related or a security related or something like that. And that allow me as part of my, in my part of that same industry to say, okay, I better crank up some more visibility and make sure right. I'm not susceptible to that. Yeah. And it, we're not even sharing at the problem level and we need to start doing that. Yeah, I think a lot of people are afraid of of confidentiality and a lot of those things, but it, it really doesn't. And that's, you know, it's it's where you and I both are advocates of, of connecting with community. And, Absolutely. Uh, it lets you have those informal relationships, which um, can often be more powerful than formal ones. You know, there, there are certain things that have to go through a lot of hoops before they make it to public announcements, but... You know, those sort of friend of a friend references. Um, I, I think I've said it many times. I think the friend DA it does more for sharing security information than um, most structured NDAs until you get into, you know, fully, you know, until you start paying for a big threat feed or yeah. until you're part of a cert and you're seeing some really deep uh, inside information. And even then, I'm not sure the. The, oh, I, I met that dude at the Linux install fest, and he, oh, I wonder if he knows about this. Or, exactly. you know, the flip side is, you know, there was, there was that woman at the Windows Server user group that, oh, you know what, I'm going to send her an email because she runs the same platforms I do and has a similar thing, and I'll just say, hey, watch out for this. And or, you know, in a, in a perfect simple. world, we'd share this and it'd be readily consumable and we wouldn't have to hide it. But, you know, the reality is we are competitive. We're trying to make a living. We're trying to make money. We're sensitive to the public perception. Uh, but any level of sharing moves us forward. And uh, Or if you you're know. at the conference together or the user group or at a local bar and you know the guys, just say, hey, you know, I've been I've seen this. I mean, seen this problem. Right. I see this all the time at VMworld, NRSA, the hallway conversations are much more interesting. Oh, absolutely. Because you know, people I mean, are saying, I got this problem, what do I do? That's, or, that's I had this that, problem, this is what I did. Absolutely. You know, that that is one of the things that, that a lot of the B-sides and, and other conferences, you know, ShmooCon's hallway track is fantastic. DerbyCon, the, the hallway track is great. At B-sides Las Vegas, one of the things we do is we have a large area, uh, but we dedicate the largest single room to chill out space, you know, on the edges are contests and, uh, you know, some of the sponsors are there and, and there are a variety of things, you know, the, the charities that we support as, you know, we're a nonprofit, but as the charities that we support like EFF and Hackers for Charity and OWASP and, uh, you know, Securing Change and others, you know, they're all in there, but the 
the bulk of the room is uh, tables and chairs, uh, high and low, big and small, to encourage conversations. And Absolutely. So you go into a talk, and somebody's talking something about metrics that's you know way over my head, and they're you know they're arguing about the the proper algorithms for displaying data in this <laughs> format from yeah. this vertical. And you're like, I, I think that's English. Some of those words sound like words I've used in my life. But they go and sit down at a table, and you know if it's if it's two people or twelve, um, it continues that conversation, and it doesn't need to be that formal. Like you said, it sits at the at the bar before or after a meeting, or you know over pizza at the back of the room during a user group meeting. You you, you share these things, um, and the next thing you know, things uh, get a little bit better, or they get a little less bad. You know, some when things go bad, they go bad. So maybe the goal is uh, sometimes making them less bad, uh, and then when when things go well, it makes them better. Absolutely. Well, Jack, thank you very much for being on the Virtualization Secure and Cloud Security podcast, video podcast, I should okay. say. <laughs> um, well, thanks for having me on. Thank you. And um, just the actionable advice, you got any last thoughts for the, something people can act on today? Yeah, I, I go back to what I tell everyone. You know, it's, it's find everything and choose then you choose what to ignore. And that's that's sort of been my uh, echoed point for the past few years, which is, like you said, it's easy to find, but you find everything, then you choose what to ignore because the real world doesn't let us fix everything. My last thought is, remember, a, guide, a hardening guide is just that, a guide. Use it properly. And please talk between the teams. It's absolutely incredibly important, even if it's just an informal Hey, you know, I have I, a, a hello would do as a starter, please. <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> You're not enemies. You're working for the same goal. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.